All right. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Well, great to see everyone coming in this evening. It's actually really kind of nice out there. It's uh, getting sunnier and warmer. Mark, it looks like it's you're out on mm -hmm. outside. Yep. Yeah. After a day of work, I just need to sit outside for a while. Yeah, great. Glad that you can work from outside. Yeah, absolutely. Good. I could work from outside all the time. I would. Right. Not sure how people would appreciate that being seen outside, but anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Good to see everyone saying hello and um, getting lots of hellos just to us, which is is fine. If you want to say hi to everyone, just make sure to send it to uh, your chat to everyone and um, not just hosts and, and panelists, if that's what you what you want. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna dive in a couple of um, announcements. If you got the email today, um, we have a really good guest speaker coming up at the end of June on fibromyalgia. Um, sleep is next week uh, with Chris. And um, <clears throat> also starting up again, just a kind of, a little bit condensed, taking a six week program into five weeks of emotional freedom from pain. And, um, and I'm gonna be doing that uh, this on Wednesdays at, at one uh, through June. And that's starting this Wednesday. So um, some of you have taken it before, you're welcome to do it again. And um, yeah, so everything's up on the class calendar at the website. All right, so let's dive into tonight's topic. So this tonight we're going to talk about reclaiming pain and reclaiming your life. And maybe I'll just stop the share for, for a moment. Um, so uh, as I was kind of getting my mind around this, this topic of what I was trying to take from, you know, from, from teaching for uh, quite a few years and uh, working and, um, and having pain that I wanted to take some of the essential elements that I find that people get to uh, maybe down the road, um, maybe already, that they have somehow been able to kind of pivot and start learning from their experience of pain as opposed to reacting or controlling or fixing all of those things, those stages that we kind of need to go through first. And as I started kind of putting the ideas together, I realized that the model of pacing, which yes, is pacing your activity. Um, it, it really boils down to like pacing your days, pacing your life in a way that is safe and healthy for your nervous system. It's very individual, very, it's, it's completely individual. Um, that was a good starting point, like a springboard to look at all these things that were obstacles to getting in the way of pacing was where what I found um, areas of great growth to happen. So we're going to kind of unpack that idea tonight. Um, oh, Mark, do you want to just start us off um, first before we uh, really, really dive into this? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, just to welcome everybody. It's uh, great to see so many people out on a Monday evening. And just, yeah, welcome on behalf of the Bill Nelms Pain and Research Centre. Um, and, uh, yeah, just again, the usual respecting one another's confidentiality and the chat and, you know, people ask questions, be respectful of one another uh, so that people feel free to ask questions um, and to express themselves. But yeah, I look forward to hearing what you have to say and let's see if we can work on this together. Great, thank you. Yeah, so I had posted in the in the chat box at, um, at the beginning, if you've tried pacing, meaning pacing your activity that we hear a lot of talk about, it's in a ton of research and literature and um, a lot of physiotherapists and doctors will encourage you um, and what your biggest challenges were. So what I'm seeing coming up um, was cultural expectations. So the expectations of, I'm assuming society that don't understand this. Um, and I, I, we're gonna, 
absolutely address. I think that's a, a really important point that it's easy to say pace yourself when everybody around you is going faster and wondering why you can't do things or uh, why you perhaps are very busy one day and then in bed for three days. All of those things, that's a big boulder. It's a big obstacle to get through. Another one I saw was um, acceptance of where you're at now. Acceptance that <clears throat> this, you know, that perhaps 10 or two or one year ago, you were really busy and you had a full life. And um, maybe through an injury or an illness or a condition, pain came along, pain didn't leave. And then, so now you're dealing with a very significant impact in your life and coming to a place of um, what's okay for me now, as opposed to what should I be doing that I was doing a few years back. That's the, those are two very, very important obstacles. So I think we're already, we're already on the right track here. All right. So I'm, can I just go back to sharing some slides around this? And um, you might uh, be able to see both Mark and I, I'm not sure. <clears throat> so what I asked was, have you heard of pacing and tried to do it? And also what was your biggest challenge? So um, yeah, you can just kind of reflect on that yourself. Uh, feel free to to put your, uh, when you think about it, what your biggest challenge is. And just some questions. Have you found it difficult to know how to pace? It, it sounds pretty straightforward, but in reality, it's, it's not always very clear. Is it hard to know when it's time to slow down? Do you get stuck in a boom bust cycle? And you could probably imagine what, what that is and talk about that a little bit. Is, does it come up that you can't seem to feel okay when you're not busy? So when you do give yourself, um, when you dare to rest or take time out, um, or perhaps, you know, maybe you have to, um, does it come up that you feel guilty or you just don't feel okay being able to rest? Um, another thing comes up is, do you feel continually stressed about not getting things done? So the thing I want you to know is that you're not alone. Um, you're not alone in this. And um, it's a, partly a product of our societal expectations and the uh, present circumstances that um, we find ourselves in. So how is it? I just want to, and I keep on using the word unpack, I just want to unpack this for a moment to, to really think about this. Like there's nothing wrong with you with having these obstacles coming up. But I, I want to ask how, how is it that busy, being busy, getting things done became almost a badge of honor. And we ask people like, what are you doing? Or what did you do today? Um, or, you know, what, uh, what do you do? So we very much emphasize in our, our culture, um, the word do or doing. And there's an expectation, or it might be true that the more we get done, the better we feel there is some satisfaction in that. There's some satisfaction in, you know, being able to clean your house or clean one part of your house or to be able to go for a walk. There's definitely satisfaction in that, but I do want to just bring that up that people that are not able to do very much um, or say, for example, people that are not unable to move, and I think you guys know this already, are still just as worthy as people that can move and can do things. And if you know anybody who lives in a wheelchair, you will, it, that's, you will see this, this very clearly. Um, but the more we get done, the better we feel. So yet most people feel continually behind, always feeling behind. And I want to ask too, like what, has culture told us that 
we are behind. Like sometimes if you have a job and it's very busy, you know exactly what you're behind. But even I find that even when people are, are not in those circumstances, we still feel behind. So I wonder what we're behind sometimes. Um, so what is driving this? And how can we now reclaim ourselves from this cult of busy to enter into what truly works, what heals, what's sustainable and loving through pacing? And I just, I see some chats coming in. So I, I just want to just check out where everybody's at. Yeah, guilt, not feeling okay. I have a list of things that need to be done. Wake up knowing that you can't complete it. So you're already behind. Like the moment that your eyes open, you're behind. A gang up on yourself for not being able to, to be the person you used to be. And people's reactions are the worst. Yeah, I so, so hear you. Um, yeah, boom bust for years, uh, creating these difficulties. We have confused human beings with human doings. Oh, so many good comments here. When having a good moment, want to take advantage, have to, yes, safe to pace because boom bust takes such a toll. Um, used to be able to do the housework for an hour and volunteer work for hours on end. And people that you were helping don't understand why you can't help them any longer and focusing on yourself right that's a um and sometimes they will never understand so then then what trying to make up for something feeling overwhelmed everyone's living their life and i can't keep up yeah and i have so many conversations with people feel like a failure yeah as a mother and wife because i can't keep up like other families oh so much so much compassion and we all know here from our classes that nobody asked for pain. Nobody asked to have this, you know, so-called test of, it, it's a, an imaginary test of pass and fail. Yeah, like I'm being left behind, personal demons, right? Racing to the next red light, <laughs> it's so true. I, I had someone like beeping behind me yesterday when I, I just, I was behind for about 10 seconds when the light turned green. And like Dawn says, they're like racing to nowhere. Uh, like they'll be 10 seconds late for wherever they're going. Yeah, from the moment you wake up, learning how to delegate tasks. Oh, so many comments, I'm gonna have to come back to this. Um, yeah, hard to slow down. A busy job, family and Kelowna lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm hearing a lot of, I just want to tune in to, to I'm hearing a lot about uh, others are not in tune with this. Explaining, teaching them can be challenging and tiring. I think how many people can relate to that? Right. Learning a boom bus, another, another label. Yeah, well, it's a way of describing, Nicole, that I think will, it kind of helps to have something in your mind um, when you know, when you catch yourself doing that. that learning how to accept new physical limitations, finding your worth. Yeah, yeah, managing expectations. Ooh, okay. Well, people, yeah, yeah, it's a, one of these invisible, in, invisible um, limitations, right? That, that nobody can see. So, so this looks, uh, yeah, like it's kind of hitting a few nails on the head. So, so let's look at first the, you know, a few obvious facts. <clears throat> yes, there are things to do. There are, are things that, that, you know, bills that need to be paid, tasks that do need attention. We do, we do know those things. Um, maybe far less than we think. Sometimes um, our minds can, can make life very complicated. And when we pare it down, sometimes it can be simpler than we think. Your level of activity has likely been mildly, moderately, or severely impacted by living with chronic pain. That, that's just a fact. We're not, gonna, we're not going to avoid that, that fact. It's normal to see this difference. And it's normal for humans to compare yourselves with either the past or with other people. 
it's we're trained from a very, very young age as part of a pack to be comparing ourselves, right? Which is why we have groups like this, where you can see that, you know, maybe we have a different bar here that we're all in this together and we're not competing here. Um, and you might be stuck in a perfectionist mind trap of what should be, what should be right now. And that is a dead giveaway of old conditioning of what should be. Don't criticize yourself for shooting all over yourself, uh, but do take note of that word because right there, it's a, a clue to what should, should be from the past or what I should be doing based on what other people think. Or, or what I think that might not be realistic in that moment. Okay, so, so this class tonight is about learning to go about your life in a way that feels authentic and healthy over the long term and what gets in the way. So I'm going to go through, um, kind of organized it into four very general steps. And Mark's going to help me um, unpack the first step in the next couple of slides. So the first step is to always to know what is actually happening in your body in, in terms of the truth about pain. And, and that um, we, we endeavor to teach that in each of our classes, a little bit about the science of chronic pain, just to remind us of the difference between acute and chronic pain. The second step is to truly realize, to really understand that moving with awareness of your body and awareness of your capacity, your energy level, is going to benefit your health physically, emotionally, and neurologically. So awareness. And I've had many conversations, you know, with people over the years that have a relative um, or maybe it's themselves who has uh, experiencing chronic pain and is not moving anymore is not going out, is afraid to go out, is afraid to move, and has become um, very disabled. So the third step is to know your activity style and become flexible to change. So that's the acceptance part that we're gonna look at. And the last step is to move through what gets in the way, um, uh, whether it's fear, having clear boundaries with people or clear communication, self-compassion. And when we come to this last step, we're gonna talk about the growth um, that can occur moving through the, the obstacles and the barriers to pacing. And this is a formula for self-development -develop and inner peace. And I just wanna add with or without pain, so pain happens to be the impetus here. And it's not one that we ever planned on having, but um, these are the conversations I also have with people who don't have pain. But pa the circumstance of pain makes these things more apparent, more obvious and more urgent. So this might be not be what you asked for, but these steps will help you to get more control of over your life. And again, I added with or without pain. These are things that are um, doorways and through pain it, it, in the end will help to um, manage pain, but also to reclaim your life. So, and then Albert Einstein says, out of the clutter that we often feel, find simplicity. So we want to find just some very simple steps at the end of tonight. From the discord, find harmony somewhere. So from the threat of danger, chronic pain in your body, we're gonna be looking for moments of feeling safe. And in the middle of this difficulty does lie opportunity. All right, so we're just gonna go the next two slides, I think. Uh, Mark's gonna take us through a reminder of what is what is neuroplastic pain. In other words, what are what is the pain that is that continues that is pretty much almost uh, uh, most types of chronic pain. Mark, I'll turn it to you. I can't remember anymore. <laughs> That's so, funny because you probably say it every single class. 
I know. Um, so what happens in chronic pain in the nervous system is that it inadvertently undergoes changes um, that basically um, put it in a sort of state of hyper alert where many, many um, stimuli are perceived as painful. Uh, for example, light touch or light pressure might be perceived as painful. And then simulations that are mild or modestly painful are perceived as extremely painful. So the nervous system is, is in a constant state of readiness or prepared, preparedness, looking for sort of these messages that, you know, that shouldn't be painful and then ramping them up. And this, this happens over time in, in many patients for a number of reasons, which we've explored you know, previously, but but it's it's basically a maladaption of our nervous system, in that it thinks that we're in a constant state of of pain or a, a, of, a, of a sort of alertness and awareness. The, the nervous system is kind of on 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 guard all the time. This sort of fight, flight, freeze response. And and we've mapped some of these changes, you know, on on uh, neural imaging, where parts of the brain will actually light up. With, with stimulations that aren't generally painful. Um, and this neuroplastic, neuro meaning nerve and plastic meaning change um, that the brain undergoes um, is what happens in, in chronic pain or sometimes referred to as uh, central sensitization in, in some forms of widespread chronic pain. So um, the neuroplastic training exercises in thoughts and emotions and movement and relaxation can help to retrain the brain to deregulate some of those changes to, to downregulate them um, those and that's what a lot of what we've done over the months has focused on is, is learning techniques that can help undo to some degree those maladaptive changes that have happened in our nervous system um, so yeah, as you said, the, the majority of chronic pain is, is neuroplastic. Uh, and that's where your nervous system is interpreting signals that or sort of over-interpreting them almost. Um, and not only coupled with pain, but um, there's often other signals like extreme fatigue, poor concentration. These go hand in hand with some of the chronic pain um, signals that keep going on and on in our nervous system. Mm -hmm. because what happens is the, the acute injury is long gone. It's often healed up, but your body doesn't know that, or your brain doesn't know that, and it keeps thinking that there's a danger signal. Right. So, yeah. Mark, there was a question about degenerative discs. I don't know if you want to uh, just touch on that, or... Let me just have a look at that in the chat quickly. Yeah. Just what about degenerative discs? Like, is that considered neuroplastic pain? Eventually, yeah, because, you know, you get an acute, you can get an acute disc injury where, you know, you herniate a disc and you have acute pain. But realistically, after three to six months, um, the herniation might still be there, but the inflammation on that around it has often settled down, but people still have ongoing pain. Um, some of that is due to, you know, the nerves being, being stimulated when you move and stuff like that. But there isn't a new ongoing, you know, perpetuating injury. It's there, it's stable. And your body has been unable to kind of downregulate those, those symptoms. So now the trick is learning to function within that new norm, you know, and, mm -hmm. and how you do that. Yeah, you know what, I have a great video I'm going to send out, uh, if I can find it, I'll put it in the, in the chat um, about that exactly about the brain continuing to process um, pain, it was made by it was a new one made by Howard Schubiner, um, including degenerative discs. So, yeah, right. Because I mean, if, if you also look at it, not to, you know, not to diminish things, but uh, some, some people with degenerative uh, disc pain um, or degenerative disc conditions have pain but many people if you if you took a random sample of the population of say a thousand people and just randomly x-rayed them 
most people over 50 are going to have some form of degenerative disc disease. It's, it's invariable. Our discs degenerate. That's just how it is. Of those right. thousand people, not everybody's going to be in pain, maybe 20%, maybe 25%. And some might have pain that varies and fluctuates, right? Right. Although they might have the identical okay. findings on, on imaging. Yeah. So yeah. That, that's what I mean about, and it's not the person's fault that they're, you know, experiencing pain. It's just what's happened in their body. So, right. you know, many people, I mean, I've got degenerative disc, if you x-ray, you know, or mm -hmm. CT my back, I'm over 40. Just right. barely, you, you, know, you wouldn't say that from my picture, I'm actually closer to 60, but, you know, um, I'm going to have degenerative discs. Uh, absolutely. Do I have pain every day? Fortunately not. Someone else with the same imaging as me can experience quite considerable pain. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so. just, this is how their nervous system has changed. You know, I'm right. just fortunate at this point, but things can change for any one of us. Right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, that, that re reminder. Um, and, and that all pain is processed in the brain. So Exactly. Um, what can we apply to straight to our brain to change our experience of pain? So <clears throat> thanks, Mark, because then the question then changes from how do I get rid of my pain, which, um, it, it, you know, it's a, it's a valid hope. Um, and there is reason to be optimistic. But that question also creates some tension and pressure to get rid of something. And then it, you can get into the, the cycle of feeling like you failed if you manage to, you know, reduce your pain and then, then, it, um, then you have an increase to ask, how do I lower my overall level of threat in my body and find more safety? And I don't just mean safety in your environment, but safety in, in your body. So stress and pressure creates the stress response, which contributes to pain. So just, Learning to, this is something from Neil Pearson, to challenge yourself, to move to the edge of pain to, and reminding yourself because the movement is healthy. So I just want to touch on this. And this slide is about moving to the edge of pain because we're talking about um, pacing, mm -hmm. you know, in a play, asking, it, is it safe for my body to do this activity? So that involves a whole lot of slowing down and asking yourself a question. Um, Ask, asking yourself, will I be okay later or tomorrow? And then <clears throat> staying at the edge of your pain. Now, can you imagine how I'm sure you can, that requires a lot of, a lot of awareness, a lot of presence in the moment to actually practice this, keeping your breath calm and your body and muscle tension low and monitoring your pain. So that's a whole lot in, in learning to slow down and move in a way that can start shifting the edge of pain, shifting the dial on your um, on the edge of your pain, if that if that makes sense. So tonight's class is actually not so much about how to pace, because that involves uh, you know um, that that would take up the whole class itself. It's a, it's a valid um, webinar topic, but we're gonna talk more about the obstacles that come up in even being able to approach this, this type of um, awareness or yeah, it's a lot of information. And so I just wanted to touch on that. And then we're going to just kind of back off a little bit from the actual um, how to pace to how to even get started with pacing, if that makes sense. So one thing I just want to bring awareness to is um, that third step is to know your activity style already. So people with chronic pain ha may have activity styles that increase their pain. And they are known as the boom bust or pain as your guide or a combination of both. So you don't have to read all this, but you could just, you could just listen because so, you probably have an idea already um, that the boom bust is basically the overdoing. So overdoing um, things in your life, overdoing activity um, usually comes with a boom phase. So you push through an activity or even a day of activities to get them done. 
you do get early warning signs of pain or fatigue, but um, ignore them to, to get things done. And you keep going until you either finish the activity or until you just can't handle the pain or fatigue anymore. So just notice for yourself when that happens, um, maybe on a, a low pain day or maybe even on a, the medium or, or high pain days, if you have that, that drive and you might slow it down and um, it just as you're thinking about it and just see what's going into that, what's going into that pressure to, to get things done that day. Because okay. it's usually followed by a bust phase and and this is um, you crash or have a flare up of pain, and then you need time to recover. And recovery, as you probably know, um, can last for hours, days, or even weeks. And it's basically from a ramped up, revved up um, nervous system that's overdone it. And when you've had pain for some time, your service, sort of your, your nervous system has become sensitized. So um, when you do overdo it, it's it not just like, you know, a regular nervous system overdoing it, it's an already sensitized nervous system overdoing it, which, mm. you know, obviously can have a big, what they call a bust phase. Um, yeah, during this phase, you, you might not even be able to do basic activities like showering, if anybody has had that, that experience. Um, yeah, Mark, do you want to say something there? Yeah, just you're, you're, you know, you're so right that that oversensitized nervous system, in the same way that it perceives painful stimuli, it's very sensitive to what's going on around, you know, that boom bust cycle, like you say, I, I have patients who, you know, think that they need to push right through things. And then you, you know, and they tell you, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, I paid for it for five days afterwards. Again, it's it's learning what your ceiling is and always working mm -hmm. up to that, you know. It's not the old adage of no pain, no gain. In other words, pushing right through, the more I push through, it'll be fine. It's we know from Neil's work that that's really mm -hmm. not the way to do it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Up to that ceiling. Yeah. Yeah. So just notice if that is your act your general activity style. Um, because it, with this style, you may think you're getting more work done by pushing through activities, but you're actually doing less because of the time spent then in flare up and recovery. And I have absolutely found that even if you can bring it down 10%, 20% in terms of um, high activity, you're going to be able to go farther and eventually get more done. Don't forget, we're looking at a, um, an approach that's going to be sustainable over the long term. So what can happen um, if you're in this uh, style for a long time, the point at which flare up will come sooner with less activity. So it, in other words, you've just, you've lowered your tolerance level. The flare up starts to last longer. You start to have more bad days than good days. So let's just quickly look at the, the second two styles. Then we've got the underdoing. And that is the one where we have heard, and I, I have heard many times, use pain as your guide. Well, in chronic pain, you know, we hear a lot about out there, like listen to your body, you know, listen to what your body's telling you. But that doesn't actually apply very well to chronic pain. It's probably the only situation that where it doesn't really directly apply. It's really important to listen. There's no question, and that might be your area of growth to actually listen to your body, but we can't actually guide our activity by our level of pain. Because if we decide that when I have a lot of pain, I'm not going to move, or if I find my pain increasing, I'm gonna stop moving, we're then not going to move very far. Because don't forget, chronic pain is like a false alarm. And it still doesn't mean you, you ignore it. So it's a, we are being called, you guys are being called to find a very fine balance between 
listening and moving. So that, this is no small task here. So in this activity style, you do an activity until you feel your pain get worse and then you immediately stop. And this, it, um, you, or you don't wanna cause yourself pain, so you stop before the pain. And over time, you do less and less activity because there's less time before the pain starts. So what can happen if I follow pain as your guide activity style? You won't be able to do as much physical activity. You'll feel more pain with less activity, right? Other systems of your body then suffer. So um, this, is, this was what we commonly found in say exercise classes or yoga classes when the teacher, and this still happens quite a bit, no, no fault of their own, when the teachers weren't aware of what chronic pain was and would say, if you got any pain, just stop, don't do that. You don't wanna damage yourself. Now we know that that probably, unless it is an injury, that probably was not the best advice. It's okay to have some pain if it's been there for a while, it's not a new pain, it's okay to keep moving, letting your body know that you're in fact safe. So then we have this combination. So you use a combination, you use a boom bust activity style on good days and pain is your guide on bad days or when you have a flare up. Um, or you use boom bust activity style for more important activities and pain is your guide for less important activities. So, so just, I just wanted to touch on that just to see if you can start to get an idea already, awareness, the stage of awareness of how you already approach activity. Okay. So what do all three of these styles have in common? The pain is in control. Okay. So you're very focused on the pain and um, the pain, either you're pushing through it or you're having a flare up or um, you're allowing pain to be the guide, right? Or both, okay? But the pain is in control. There are days like that. And absolutely, uh, sometimes, sometimes the pain does take over. But over the long term, we, we want to be in control of, to as much as we can, of our activity and of our, of our life. So these, um, these cycles are an all or nothing and create stress uh, in your body. And you can't do as much activity over time. So at, in the end, um, your life is less within your control, right? So this brings us to, that kind of sets the stage for the part that I really wanna talk about tonight. And that is this edge of growth. In other words, moving through what gets in the way of being able to come to more of this very fine balance of being able to pace ourselves. So what might look like boulders may actually become doorways. And just hang on to that thought for a moment. So these might be areas of growth that are beneficial for you as a human, as well as for pain. And as I said earlier, pain makes this growth, this growing edge that we're talking about more urgent and more, more necessary. And again, these areas of healing that I'm gonna get into on the next slide are going to help us no matter what the pain does. And I think you'll find a lot of commonalities in what we're just about to talk about. Mark, did you have anything to add so far? Um, yeah, there was a comment about uh, medication work for retraining the brain. You know, that would be great, um, but we just, we're just not that far down the road in terms of mm. blocking some of those neurotransmitters. And, you know, um, we, we really aren't. I mean, we've got some medications that can sometimes help in some patients. Um, but I mean, they're not spectacular. And, and the general, the usual pain 
painkillers, you know, the anti-inflammatories and the opiates are absolutely terrible in this regard. And, and, you know, especially the opiates are definitely not recommended for long, long-term use in most patients. There's a role for some of the, the more novel ones uh, because they don't just have opiate, you know, blocking drugs. And then other medications like Cymbalta or Lyrica or Gabapentin, it, some people are helpful, but they're not a, here's a fix all for everything. So there, there really is a paucity of medications that are, are effective. I mean, some people do respond, a, a small number of patients do respond to some medications, but it's certainly not like, oh yeah, this will, you know, this will help mm -hmm. you tremendously. We just don't have those medications because I think it's so complex. It's not just you know, the neurotransmitters that the medications target or parts of the neurosystem. There is the, the neuropsychological, emotional components to pain that, that also, you know, affect how we perceive pain. And, and mm -hmm. without like learning, pacing, mindfulness, relaxation, managing our emotions, there's no pull that fixes all of those things, you know? Yeah, I wish there was, hey. Or we'd be out of a job and we could just write a prescription. But yeah, it'd be great for everybody. I, mm -hmm. I would love it. But there, I'm there trying to work myself out of a job. I will, you know, wouldn't it be great if Absolutely. these classes were not even needed? Like, I, you know, can you see a day? Anyway, that's a whole other topic. I'd love to see a day where we actually don't need pain clinics. But I don't know if it'll come in my lifetime. Yeah, and, you know, and I think before we started this work a few years mm -hmm. ago, most people manage their pain by basically obliterating it with opioids, which is, you know, a lot of, it was a lot of our fault as physicians trying to help them. Mm -hmm. we, didn't, we didn't really know the severe downsides. No. So they were pretty numb, but they weren't managing their pain. They were just basically numb and the risks are absolutely horrendous, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so this journey really, um, you know, that Mark's talking about, they, they, yeah. And somebody said, and Nicole says mindfulness and breathing, uh, the self-compassion, all these things that were all the doorways that we've been talking about through these webinars are really a true coming home to yourself in your own nervous system. And because your life and how, not, maybe not life or death, but how you live your life actually depends on, on that. And it might be in combination with medications and injections. Um, sometimes those can be very valuable as well. But shifting your nervous system through pacing can only ever come from you. And of course, with, with assistance, uh, you're not alone. It, it's, uh, you know, with support. So here are some healing keys to consider when reclaiming your life through this activity of pacing. And I want to emphasize that the obstacles that you are finding um, that people have listed in the chat are um, that you're not alone, that I think the whole group is noticing these same obstacles. So when you're confronting them in your own life, remember that it's not personal. It's not about you. It's often about um, how we've been trained and about how our society um, is functioning and how our society is perceiving or not perceiving um, uh, people who have, um, you know, condition that is, is invisible. So the first one to think about is allowing the truth of your emotions. And what I mean by that is allowing yourself, how many times have, you know, have I heard people be told or pretty much, you know, um, whether you're a man or, or a woman uh, growing up that you were too sensitive or, you know, don't be, um, don't be sad. You've got so much to be grateful for. Uh, uh All of those things, you coming back to the truth of how you feel. If you feel sad, you feel sad. If you feel, um, if you're feeling grief over the way things were, sometimes you need to have um, a good cry in order to bring yourself up to the present moment. Sometimes there's some grief and loss to move through. 
So allowing the truth of your emotions sometimes is one of the biggest doorways to healing, even from pain. Um, and there's been a lot of research around this, which is why we're offering the Wednesday class again, that finding ways to either express to someone that, that you know, um, or just to simply feel it yourself and acknowledge it, to see yourself um, rather than waiting for other people to see or validate you. Now, that is one doorway that, um, you know, even people who don't have pain uh, struggle with as well. But again, this brings it even more crucial back to us to allow the positive emotions and allow the so-called negative emotions, the anger, maybe there's anger there or uh, fear, the fear about the, the future. So allowing yourself just to feel what you feel um, is a real doorway. And some people journal, again, there's a lot of research around just journaling out emotions and really being honest with yourself about how you feel. So I'm just, want to check and see if there's any yeah anger fear grief mm. yeah I, and I really hear that someone says to I just can't let it seem to allow myself any slack that is a growing edge right there that we're going to get into when we become really critical of ourselves right and really somehow we have learned as humans to we've learned well how to beat ourselves up that we've practiced, we know that one, but we haven't really practiced how to be compassionate towards ourselves. And again, some people can just go through their, their, their life being really critical of themselves. But when you're presented with pain, it does behoove you to learn some self-compassion. And that's a class in itself, but we'll touch on it. So yeah, learning not to beat myself up and allow my feelings to come as they are. That's, that's beautiful. Exactly that. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, we notice ourselves criticizing and you're, you might need to set some inner boundaries on, oh, I'm not, you know, I'm not doing that to myself today. I'm, I'm not going to bully myself today. Today, I'm going to allow myself to feel how I feel what I feel and, and move through my day in a way that that feels right for me. So <clears throat> the next doorway, undoing, I, I originally put undoing the myth of I am how much I do, but I actually changed the word to trauma. And that might sound like a strong word to use, but I, I want to unpack that a little bit. So if you have been brought up as most a lot of people, I won't say most, have in, in, you know, in our culture, we are very much rewarded at a probably very young age for what we do and, um, and not for what we don't do. So starting out very young, we learn what we're supposed to do. And that's coming from someone else. That's coming from the outside world. And so we start to equate our own worth with how much I do. And it might be how much money I make. And, you know, chronic pain gets in the way of that. It is, I call it a trauma pattern of, of, you know, that a lot of very high achievers fall into that because if they're, if they come to a place where they can't do what they were doing, they can't achieve what they were achieving, they really fall back into anxiety and depression. So we want to undo that link between I, my worth depends on how much I do. And that is a definitely a pushing area of pushing in the edge of growth that can be triggered by a pain condition. Because if, if you really think about it realistically, your worth, yeah, does not, has nothing to do with what you do, what you do. It's a completely different thing. So the next one is, and I saw a few people touch on this around clear boundaries. Again, it's an, it's an, it's an edge of growth that 
many or uh, most I, I, many people um, did not learn how to be really clear in expressing their boundaries over um, what they can do, even to themselves, what they can do and what they can't do. So being able to learn how to say no, um, no, I can't do that today, or no, maybe no, I don't want to do that today. Maybe it's not within a, the high priority, not in a high priority for you. And when you only have so much energy in your day, you really have to get clear on what you value the most what's the most important and putting your energy towards those things. Um, this, this is actually really good medicine for pain because you, you can imagine the, how the, your stress level would decrease if you didn't have any guilt or worry about around setting boundaries. And also not falling into that trap of feeling like you need to explain everything to everybody. Yes, there are some conversations to be had, but not everybody's ever gonna get it. So you might have to pull yourself back in from saying, I don't not, I'm actually not gonna defend or explain myself anymore. And you know, it's funny, as soon as I said that, I felt my shoulders just go like this because when you start letting go of what does not feel necessary anymore, what you've tried and tried, they're not getting it, let it go, let it go. Um, it's, uh, it's too much of a burden to carry. Uh, the I'm sorry, oh, like apologizing, I think is what N Nicole is, say is saying. Um, yeah, find it hard, very, yeah, find it hard not to feel guilty, even though intellectually, I understand that I need to set limits for myself. So there is an edge of growth right there. Even, and it might sound small, it's not small. Learning to not feel guilty when setting a boundaries can be, you know, a real um, valid life goal, right? So that might involve going back and relearning um, around boundary setting that you are worth protecting, that you have the right to set boundaries, you have the right to be respected, um, and letting go of the outcome of other people's reactions don't have any, um, other people's reactions don't mean that you haven't, that you've done something wrong. Wait, am I getting my words right? If somebody has a negative reaction to a boundary, doesn't mean you've done something wrong. Yeah. So clear boundaries is a, a real, um, a real edge of growth. Here's another one, another key to consider becoming more aligned with your own values. And what is truly important? What are you wasting your precious energy on that no longer fits for you that you're no longer aligned with? How much time do you spend on stressful things as opposed to things and people that feel peaceful to you? So we tend to spend a lot more time trying to fix, change, and improve the areas that feel stressful or the relationships that feel stressful. How much time are you actually taking in spending time um, and energy in what is truly aligned with your values? Now, if inside your head you're saying, oh gosh, I don't even know what I value anymore. My values have had to change. You know, what I prioritize has had to change. It might be a really good uh, exercise to take some time to sit and, and be quiet and really allow yourself to almost like recalibrate to now. Now, what do I value? Now, who do I value in my life? This is a really good exercise in simplifying things. And then it becomes clear what I'm going to spend my energy on. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so a couple more uh, keys. Moving to self-compassion and self-acceptance. Um, I think I saw someone uh, mention this earlier around like self-compassion, I think meditations or loving kindness meditations, really coming to a place to not only just, okay, that's it. I'm going to be nice to myself and I'm going to going to accept myself for who I am. Easier said than done. It often involves moving through all the um, barriers or the beliefs that have gotten in the way of being able to accept yourself now. Um, so there, I, I guess I'll just for the sake of tonight, point you to um, Kristen Neff's website and some of the self-compassion practices there. And I'll just write her name, Kristen Neff. And I want to, um, uh, just emphasize that when, if and when you start to practice more self-compassion as opposed to self-criticism, it can feel awkward. It can feel strange. It can feel like this is stupid. You know, all those things. That's okay because it's new. We're talking about um, we're talking about areas of growth. Okay. So just starting to go a little kinder, a little, a little bit nicer to yourself, and and see, like to see yourself that you're suffering is very different. To see clearly I'm suffering right now is very different than feeling sorry for yourself or you may have been told in the past, you know, don't feel sorry for yourself. That's not what this is at all. This is really clean and clear. I see that I'm suffering. Oh, good, yeah. Okay, so healing from perfectionism. Obviously, we're not going to unpack that now in the next like five or 10 minutes. I did put a class up there two weeks from now, we're going to talk more specifically about perfectionism. And this, um, I guess, cult of, of perfectionism, it's like, it's almost like a, um, an epidemic of, of perfectionism. And be able, being able to come to a place, and what I find is really helpful to ask is, ask yourself, is this good enough? When you start worrying about something, you know, um, whether it's, I'll use the example of cleaning the house or being a, a good mother or a good father, a good parent or a good spouse, just please ask yourself, maybe, just maybe this is good enough. Maybe this is good enough. Considering what I feel like today, or just that I'm human, maybe what's right now, this is good enough. And that can really help to take the edge off what I should be. And who says that that is, who sets the barrier? Who sets the ceiling, or, sorry, the bar of how you should be? Where does that even come from? That like you didn't make the rule, those rules. None of us did. Um, but just to ask yourself, like who, when we talk about perfectionism, it's an unreachable, invisible bar that um, creates a lot of stress and a, a lot of distress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just being out, maybe this is good enough, you know, um, and seeing how uh, not only um, not only are you imperfect, but that everybody is imperfect in one way or another. Um, and when you find yourself striving for something else, something there's nothing wrong with wanting to improve, but if it creates a constant gap between where you are, where you should be, come back to maybe this is good enough. And I want to just warn you that there might be part of your brain that says, well, then if that's just good enough, I'm never going to change. I'm never going to get better. Uh, -uh. It's, it's exactly the opposite that happens. Maybe this is good enough right now. The nervous system calms down. The nervous system knows you're safe here. Then you have more space to move. Yes, you still grow. Mark, do you have anything else to say? I've got a couple more and then two more slides. 
Yeah, you know, just on that point of oh. sort of more aligned and values, I was just sitting here thinking, you know, I think we're so busy beating ourselves up or putting these demands on ourselves um, that it doesn't really allow time to just take in some of the, the good things that might be happening or some things that we appreciate, whether it's just, you know, a beautiful sky or, you know, your grandchild smiling or whatever, whatever it is, and sitting and listening, you know, just quiet, just, just realizing that if you slow down and you can actually let some of the things in that, that you actually find pleasant in your life, um, because sometimes we're so busy doing things, you know, making this feeling busy, we don't even really take the time to enjoy some of the small things that happen, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I think we, I mean, we didn't talk about that. It's a whole subject on its own, but just, it's almost like we cut some of the positive things that might be happening off because we're so busy beating ourselves up, you know? Yes. Or so busy having to do or to, you know, um, you know, yeah. yeah. So busy. I'm busy. I'm, but so just busy. sitting here, you know, like, yeah, you know, like just thinking about like, you know, today and now slowing down for an hour, it's like, Wow, it actually feels fantastic just to, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Think about it. Which which means really having a better relationship with yourself, um, and yeah. So, and and having some inner boundaries around that worry, around um, mm -hmm. you know what's not getting done. Yeah, what's not getting done, or what won't get done tomorrow. Um, and having some ways of being able to say, well, you know what, good enough today, mm -hmm. today, this moment, this mm -hmm. moment is I'm good enough to be able to sit in the sun. I'm good enough to stop and enjoy my cup of tea. I'm, and again, like pain makes us more important, but this is, you know, mindfulness and slowing down to the moment of now, <clears throat> which is the only moment we ever have is right here is a, it really is a lifelong practice that will only help uh, pain. Yeah, the simple pleasures, absolutely. So all of these doorways are holding the key to emotional and physical healing through managing your energy. Okay, so pain management, pacing, is really energy management. And I want to leave you tonight with this, um, with this slide, some of you, I think you know this, uh, the spoon theory. And this is, I can't remember her name now, who, who developed this. And she found it was a helpful way to describe to people what life is like for her. Um, because pain management is um, energy management. So how she explained this is my day's energy level is represented by spoons. Each daily task is a spoon using up various levels of mental, emotional, and physical energy. Because when we're talking about pain, all of these things, it's not just physical, all of these things drain our energy. So you start with a number of spoons. And once I've used up my daily number of spoons, all energy is depleted. And using energy beyond this point simply borrows more spoons reserved for the next day. So I encourage you to, again, come back home to yourself. And really, if you can, get clear on what, depending on the day, you know, depending on how you feel, what you want to spend your spoons on that day. And when you get to the point of, you know that you've used up, you know you've used up your daily number of spoons, that digging into more spoons are, is gonna take up the spoons for the next day. And, um, and really coming to that place of, when the spoons are all gone, good enough for today. You're not giving up, you're, but you are actually in that moment practicing such incredible self-compassion and that is only good medicine for pain 
because I know, and you know, that the strongest people are not those who show strengths, you know, flex their muscles in front of us, but those who win battles that we know nothing about. And I know that you guys are fighting and winning a lot of battles in your own life. And I hope that these tools can, these keys can be doorways in to start really getting, um, really reclaiming your life in a way that doesn't matter what anybody else thinks, because the main thing is that I'm paying attention to me and I am um, living my life in the best way now that uh, that is working for for me. So. So, yeah, so I hope that this class has has um, maybe opened up one new thing for you. Yeah, yeah, validation. Absolutely. This is the place to to get validation because you you're not alone and all of these things. Um, yeah, those small wins, daily thankfulness. Yeah. And if you can take away one of those areas of growth tonight to um, uh, that might be your, you know, that might be your life journey, taking life a spoon at a time. I like that, Gadahela. Great. Okay. Good night, everyone. And next week, I'll be back with Chris for um, talking about sleep. Great. Awesome. Have a good night.